This segment of WGCU's Local Untold Stories is underwritten by Sanibel Harbor Resort and Spa. Located at the mouth of the Caloosahatchee River by the Sanibel Causeway, Punta Rasa, as we know it today, has very little resemblance to its remarkable and intriguing history. Over time, Punta Rasa has been witness to an ever-changing cast of characters. From car ferry captains, to cracker cowboys, to colored infantry, through Cuban fishermen and Calusa Indians. The story of Punta Rasa extends far beyond today's captivating lure of tourists at the luxurious Sanibel Harbor Resort and Spa. Opened in 1989, the resort revived life to the point which had been virtually abandoned since the car ferry stopped running 26 years earlier. Punta Rasa is a very uh, interesting spit of land out into uh, uh, San Carlos uh, Salem and it's the southernmost location of, the, of an entrance to Charlotte Harbor. So if you were coming from Europe, if you're coming from the Bahamas, if you're coming from Cuba, the first entryway into Charlotte Harbor would be at Ponorasa. Its deep water, coastal location has affected its many roles throughout history. For three decades before the controversial construction of the Sanibel Causeway in 1963, the car ferry from Punta Rasa connected the mainland with the outlying islands. As kids, we used to get up in the pilot house and, and talk to uh, Captain Crumpler. And uh, his kids sometimes would ride with him because we played with them. He had three girls and a boy. He was quite a uh, talker. And uh, he did, after the ferry got going, the engineer would come up and steer, and he'd go around and collect the fares and talk a lot. The end of the car ferry was, for many, the end of an era. The opening of the causeway changed perceptions. Francis Bailey recalls his first trip across the bridge. And then when I got on the island and turned right, it was a, really an eerie feeling to see the vegetation that I knew there. And five or ten minutes before, I was over at Punta Rasa. <laughs> I used to take it nearly half an hour. It, I don't know how to explain it, but it was a really a sort of an odd, eerie feeling. One of the only remnants of the days of the ferryboat captains is the old bunkhouse that Judge Lamar Rose, known as the Hanging Judge because of his support of the death penalty, had barged up Pine Island Sound to his getaway on Upper Captiva Island. So the Judge Rose lived up here, and so he bought it in 1966 and brought it up here and put it on the pilings out there in the water as a guest house. Without written documentation to prove it was the bunkhouse, the structure's historical veracity has been questioned. In fact, much of Punta Rasa's past has not been well documented. Any community that never had a newspaper would be handicapped in, in recording its history. Like Fort Myers and Punta Gorda had newspapers at an early period of time, so we know much more about them because you did have the advantage of newspapers. Uh, Sometimes a community that didn't have a newspaper had a local person who, who wrote a column occasionally for other area newspapers, and that's very valuable. And a little of that exists about Punta Rasa, particularly a, a few articles that were in the, in the Fort Myers Press uh, in the early period of time is very helpful. There would also be the, the, the documents of the National Archives, which would record the activity of the of forts and the military in the area. Uh, but there isn't much other literature. What is apparent is that Punta Rasa's deep water port has always served as a key location in southwest Florida. Before the car ferry came onto the scene in the 1930s, the spit of land at the south side of the mouth of the Caloosahatchee River was one of the area's earliest destinations for sport fishermen. 
Many of them were lured to Punta Rosa by the Schultz Hotel Company. Unfortunately, the establishment burned down in 1906. The hotel was rebuilt, but then lost to fire again a few years later. The Schultz Hotel Company was predated by the Tarpon House, an inn established at Punta Rosa in the early 1880s. In fact, Thomas Edison was on a visit to the Tarpon House when he discovered what would fast become his winter estate. In 1885, when Edison visited Punta Rosa, he was intent on fishing and learning all about uh, the plant material in the area. Uh, he met some of the locals, and the locals uh, took him up river. He docked here on this property and, uh, and bought it almost immediately. The property was up the Caloosahatchee River, about 10 miles from Punta Rosa, right along the cattle trail. I'm back in the side of the again Out where a friend is a friend When Edison discovered the property, there was a building on it. It was an early cracker house that's right in back of me here. Uh, it was used by the cattlemen who were running the cows right down through the middle of his property to Punta Rosa. And so the property contained uh, two halves of a riverside estate divided by a cattle road with a cattleman's house on it. The property was owned by the Summerlin family, who were cattlemen. They were shipping their cows uh, from Punta Rosa to Cuba. That was an important economy of this area. By the time Edison came, that economy was changing slightly. So Summerlin was very uh, willing to sell his property for, uh, for the price of $2,350 to Thomas Edison. Edison bought the land for almost five times what Sam Summerlin had paid for it several years earlier. Summerlin's father, Jake, was one of the most notable characters to have spent time at Punta Rosa, known as the King of the Crackers. Jake is said to have always dressed like a pauper, but he also had a fortune of royal stature. Despite its negative connotation in other parts of the South, in Florida, the term cracker comes from moving cattle. When the first Anglos started to come into Florida before the Civil War, they came in here with, with wagons and carts that were drawn by oxen. And to make these oxen pull a load, they had a whip and they cracked the whip. Well, when they got here to Florida, and they wouldn't beat the animal with it, but they would just crack the whip and make the animal go ahead from the sound. When they got here to Florida, they found all these wild cattle, but they couldn't use a lariat rope like they use out west to work these, these cattle. But they found that they could take that whip that they used to drive the oxen with, and by making it longer or elongating it, that they could move cattle. And it's through the cracking of this whip, and this is a cow whip that I hold here in my hand, that's how we get our nickname, the Florida Crackers. Jacob Summerlin was perhaps one of the most well-known Florida Crackers who ever lived. And they called him J Big Jake, some people did, but he was he was really an amazing person. He started out uh, as an impoverished youth, and he drew himself up by his bootstraps, and he was a man that uh, was unpretentious. He didn't care anything about fancy clothes, clothes and fancy houses and all those kind of things. And he was honest. He didn't gamble. He didn't drink. And he was really quite, quite a man. He was benevolent. He helped a lot of, a lot of uh, families, widows and whatnot. And uh, the, the people that worked with him and around him uh, were very, very loyal to him. Uh, he came to Punta Rasa. He continued to stay here. Uh, he had an old house here. He developed Punta Rasa into one of the major cattle shipping points in the world. During the 1870s, Summerlin and his associate, Captain F.A. Hendry, shipped more than two million dollars in cattle out of Punta Rasa, accounting for 165,000 head of cattle. After the uh, Civil War, it established uh, a, a wharfage and a facility at Punta Rasa for the purpose of shipping cattle. The cattle were shipped live primarily to, to different markets in Cuba, but also to Key West. Thousands and thousands of head of cattle were, were shipped from Punta Rasa over the, the years from 1866 into the 1920s. Uh, but the, the years of the greatest uh, volume of 
cattle shipping activity would have been between 1866 and, and after the, immediately after the Spanish-American War. There were some years in which it was much less because of varying factors such as the, the, uh, the market in Cuba, the, uh, uh, the production of cattle within Florida, and also the Cuban government could easily increase or decrease the, the reception of Florida cattle by increasing or decreasing the tariff. So it was not a, a continually even business, but it was certainly a very important economic activity to Florida for the years in which the Punarasa port served as a principal cattle shipping facility for Florida. At that time, crackers dominated the scene and Punta Rasa was a legendary location. And they were kind of gaunt and they were kind of a bedraggled look, looking bunch of guys for the most part, but they lived out in the woods. They fought the mosquitoes, they fought snakes, alligators, panthers, wolves, bears, they, they did it all and slept on the ground in the middle of the woods most of the time. When the cow hunters arrived in Punta Rasa at the end of their cattle drive, things changed. They were paid in Spanish gold, gold doubloons. And uh, back in those days, Punta Rasa was quite a wild town. And like anywhere, when people get off of a cattle drive, they want to party and drink a little bit and raise cane and sand and all that stuff. And it was all done here at Punta Rasa. In 1867, the Ocean Telegraph Company built a cable station at Punta Rasa. George Schultz, the first telegraph operator at Punta Rasa, found that he often had cracker cowboys tired from the cattle drives camping out at the old army barracks that were used as the telegraph station. That enticed him to establish the Schultz Hotel Company. The telegraph station would be the first in the U.S. to receive the news of the sinking of the Maine in Havana Harbor in 1898. The sinking of that ship is said to be one of the factors that led to the Spanish-American War. Before the telegraph station, early tourists, or cattle shipping, Punta Rasa served as a military post. During the Civil War, Punta Rasa set the stage for a host of interesting scenarios, including naval action and an eclectic array of troops. In our backwater country here, the U.S. Navy didn't get around to really increasing its presence here until about 1863, the middle of 63. Prior to that, blockade runners operated out of the Clusatchee River and the Peace River. And many times, they sailed out right past where I'm sitting behind me here, and they ran to Cuba and the Bahamas. And what would they carry going out? They would carry cotton that was brought down by wagons from the uh, Central Florida and Upper Florida cotton plantations, and they would carry out turpentine. And what would they bring in? They would bring in manufactured goods, household goods, soap, um, uh, those kind of domestic articles that by the war, well, about a year into the war, were very difficult to find, and people were paying a lot of money. How much would you pay for soap if you hadn't had any in two years. Naval action would eventually take place, leaving shipwrecks in its wake. Ships had been captured running the blockade in the Clusatchee River, the Peace River, Shar Harbor. On September 30th, 1863, we see the first ship capture right here at Ponorasa. We believe it came out of Cuba, and it had 20 bags of salt on it and one barrel of rum. And it was, of course, going into this area to pick up cotton and turpentine to run out. Now, when the Navy captured the ship, uh, they immediately realized that this ship was in very bad shape. And it wasn't even seaworthy enough to take to Key West to sell in an auction. And therefore, they decided to destroy it right where it sat, right here at Panarasa. And her bones, the ship's bones, are under that water and under the muck below the water along with the bones of about half a dozen other ships that sank here in the 19th century. By the end of 1863, the U.S. Navy had shut down blockade running in the area. And in 1864, the U.S. Army reactivated its military outpost in Fort Myers 
which had first been established in 1850 and brought troops ashore at Pantarassa. And we have an interesting description of Pantarassa during the Civil War. Colonel John Wilder was commander of the 2nd United States Colored Infantry Regiment. And he was stationed in Key West, and he had parts of his regiment in Key West and parts of them here at Pantarassa, parts of them at Fort Myers. He sailed here on uh, some time off that he had on a small sloop from Key West to see the area where some of his men were stationed. And he wrote an article in 1868 in Putnam's Magazine which gives a description, uh, one of our few wartime descriptions of Punarasa. And he describes it as a very pretty and sunny land with very little vegetation on the point of land that stuck out into the bay. Military records indicate that the bizarre array of troops stationed at Puntarasa could barely communicate with each other. One unit was a small regiment comprised of pro-Union Floridians. Another unit that was here were elements of the 110th New York Infantry from the area of Yonkers, New York. And the third unit that was here was the 2nd United States Colored Infantry, a black regiment of former slaves from the Virginia area. And the fourth unit that was stationed here were elements of the 99th United States Colored Infantry, which were former slaves from Louisiana. And uh, there are some very interesting stories about uh, the Union troops that were stationed here and at Fort Myers, which were a very diverse group. And from different parts of the country and different backgrounds, they had different accents. And frequently, the New Yorkers couldn't understand the black Virginians who couldn't understand the black Louisianans. And the white Floridians uh, were having trouble understanding all of them. But they were all on the same side. These Union soldiers weren't the first troops at Pantarassa. A few decades before the Civil War, Pantarassa had already seen military occupation. Pantarassa essentially was encompassed by Fort Delaney in the 1830s. Fort Delaney was a United States Army military facility that was occupied by several companies of infantry. The fort, however, suffered a mighty blow in 1841. There are a number of hurricanes that figured significantly in the history of Punarasa. Principally, the, the hurricane of 1841, uh, that is a hurricane that, that, that was reported to have created a tidal wave. But whether it was a tidal wave or not is, is more academic than, than real because the land at Punarasa is very low and flat. It was very easy for the waters to flow over it. In this instance, it destroyed the Fort Delaney. There, a couple of the soldiers were killed, and, and every building there, including the hospital, was destroyed. Uh, it was some time before there was serious consideration of rebuilding Punarasa. Before it became a significant location for military purposes, Cubans and Native Americans made a living harvesting mullet and other fish in the rich estuary waters near Punarasa. The earliest time the name Puntarasa, which in Spanish would have been Punta Rasa, meaning kind of flat landscape, open, probably treeless at that time, um, that would have been in the mid 18th century. So it doesn't show up in the Spanish colonial period, probably because while the Calusa were here, they would have called it with their own names. The Spanish name was probably applied by the Cuban fishermen who came back and really frequented these waters in the winter season throughout most of the 1700s and even as late as the uh, 1830s. One of the first accounts of Puntarasa by official U.S. sources occurred in 1824. When Florida became a possession of the United States in 1821, Puntarasa apparently had already been an established Spanish fish rancho for maybe a hundred or more years. The first time that I have seen it referred to was in 1824. When the, when the Terrier, part of Commodore Porter's anti-pirate fleet, came up into Charlotte Harbor and was here for a few weeks uh, checking on activity that was reported by pirates. The, the evidence that they found about pirates was very scant, but certainly there was no difficulty in reporting about the, the fishing rancho near Punarasa. And the captain of the Terrier 
indicated that there were about 20 people that were living there. The, the principal people living at the rancho would have been Spanish, but the majority of people would have been Indians. Uh, so it certainly had a, a long period of time, an indefinite period of time, in which it would have been essentially used for commercial fishing by Spanish fishermen from Cuba who were taking their catch back to Cuba each season. Paterasa probably would have been one of the most important Cuban uh, fishing ranchos that would have been in existence certainly as late as the 1830s when we have documents that specify the four major ranchos of which Paterasa was one of them. Um, it's a deep water access point. It's a good point where the ships, the schooners and sloops, the sailing vessels that came out of uh, Havana Harbor could anchor and Paterasa would have been a likely spot for them to have seasonal visitation. In other words, they would come up here in the late fall, arrive, fish through the mullet season, which would be November, December, early January, and eventually have all their fish in barrels salted, ready for sale at the beginning of Lent down in Havana. So for a century or more, they would have been coming up here just during the winter time and camping at this spot. But eventually, the native Creek Indians, the ones who had moved into the area, began to trade with them and eventually get hired by them as fishing hands, etc., and maybe eventually intermarry with them. It was several centuries before Spanish Cubans regularly fished the waters near Punta Rosa that the first European explorers had set foot in the area. Spanish conquistadors came to southwest Florida in the early 1500s, and some researchers believe a major claim to fame rests on Punta Rosa. Punta Rosa was probably the likeliest spot where the original landing of Ponce de Leon in 1513 occurred. The Spanish accounts are pretty vague, but there's a, a map that dates the same time period that shows the location of certain villages, which we think were from the Calusachi River and just south of it. And based on the text descriptions, in my opinion, the best likelihood is that those ships arrived somewhere at San Carlos Bay, Sanibel, Estero Islands, and very likely the first contact between Calusa Indians who were interacting and trading with the Spaniards in 1513 would have been right at Punta Rosa or maybe in that immediate vicinity. However, other historians maintain it's hard to determine where Ponce de Leon may have first set foot in southwest Florida. Differing accounts of probable locations range from Tampa Bay south to the 10,000 Islands. One thing is certain, the Calusa Indians had actually been in and around Punta Rosa for many, many centuries before Ponce de Leon first arrived in the region. Paterasa probably had prehistoric occupation, uh, in other words, there's shell mound archaeological sites that date back well into the deep prehistoric period. Um, but what you find is that around six, seven, eight hundred AD, you begin to see a shift in settlement patterns so that people that once lived probably year round on Paterasa would have ultimately kind of migrated to nearby large villages one of which would have been at Shell Creek, right near the mouth of the Clusatchee River, which isn't far away. But Punta Rosa, at the time of Spanish contact, say in the 16th century, might have been only a seasonally, episodically visited spot. And nearby villages would have provided the residential population of Calusa. The indigenous inhabitants of Southwest Florida considered Punta Rosa to be a vital location. Punta Rosa forms part of the Calusa heartland. In other words, it's where the Native Americans that we know as Calusa uh, were had their, their home base, their chiefly capital was located in Estero Bay just to the south uh, at what's known as Mount Key today. And the mouth of the Clusahatchee River was an incredibly important part of the landscape, the social landscape of the Calusa. And that was because their coastal occupations, all these large village sites that were located all up and down Pine Island Sound and San Carlos Bay and Estero Bay, all had a connection to the interior up the Clusahatchee River. And the reason for that was to trade shell and maybe salted fish and marine resources with the people in the interior on the lake district around Lake Okeechobee who had uh, aquatic rhizomes, these plant tubers that they turned into flour which could be made into bread. And so there was a, a lot of canoe traffic and um, Punta Rosa was precisely right on that kind of corridor of trade, right at the linchpin between the coastal populations and the deep interior. So it would have been very, very important. The historical significance of Punta Rosa defies its modern day appearance, which is lavishly dominated by one of the area's few four diamond resorts. 
though it proves difficult to pinpoint many exact details about its past, Punta Rasa still maintains quite a story to tell. Throughout many an era, from car ferry captains, to cracker cowboys, to colored infantry, through Cuban fishermen and Calusa Indians, Punta Rasa has been the stage for many a story to unfold, each in its own time, its own setting, cast with its own unique set of characters. To order a video of this program, call 1-888-824-0030 or visit our website at wgcu.org and please refer to the program number on your screen. This program was produced for the citizens of Southwest Florida by WGCU Public Media. Show your appreciation for programs like these. Become a member of WGCU, a business supporter, or leave a legacy through a state or planned gift. Visit our website at wgcu.org.